By coincidence, Bill Porter stepped into the ancient Chinese literary world in the 1970s, and that changed everything. To many Chinese, he is known as Red Pine, an author of popular books on Chinese hermits or ancient poets. He would even travel around just to have a drink with these poets, something which may seem strange to many Chinese people. Why has Chinese culture inspired him so much? What has he learned from it? And what is the key to translation? Welcome to this uh, special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. I'm pleased to be joined from Port Townsend near Seattle by Bill Porter, an American writer, translator and sinologist. Bill, welcome to The Point. Well, thank you for inviting me, Liu Xin. Thank you for being here. Do you have many hats, Bill? Um, sinologist, writer, a traveler, um, author, of course, a translator. Some other people call you a Zen practitioner or cultural commentator. You were a journalist, of course. Um, which one fits you the best? I'm a translator. Yeah? Why? That's what I'm, go that's what I'm good at because I've, I've, gotten, I've discovered the secret of translation. Wow, fascinating. I, I studied translation. I was studying English language and literature in university, so I'm looking forward to hear what your key is. But keep it there for the moment. Let's talk about your life a little bit because uh, you have a very interesting uh, experience. I mean, in the beginning, you had no idea, had no interest in Chinese culture or Chinese language. It was That's rather, right. <laughs> it was rather um, a coincidence, isn't it? It was. I was graduating from University of California in Santa Barbara, and I wanted to go study, uh, get a PhD at Columbia University, and I wanted to study with the most famous anthropologists in America, Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict. So I applied, but I didn't have any money. I was. I had. I got a hundred dollars a month from the GI Bill because I'd been in the U.S. Army. Um, and so there was a bunch of fellowships I could apply for. And one was a language fellowship. And this was 1970. And it was for an American who wanted to study a rare language. And I had just read a book about Zen Buddhism, Chanzong. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was wonderful. It had some Chinese characters in it. And just so on a whim, I wrote in the word Chinese. And they gave me a four-year fellowship to go to Columbia. And I, I was so embarrassed because <laughs> it was a fraud. I had... I had no interest in Chinese or Chinese <laughs> anything. I wanted the money. So I, uh, I spent a, a, the summer, before I went to Columbia, I spent the summer at the Monter Monterey Institute of Foreign Studies uh, learning some Chinese. And so when I got to Columbia, I, could, I knew a little bit. But it was so hard. It was so hard. The first class I took required... Uh, how intense. old were you back then? 20-something? Let's see, I was 20, 26. 26. Yeah, I was 26. But okay. while I was studying Chinese, I began learning about these people like Lao Tzu and Confucius. And, and also I met a monk in Chinatown who yeah. taught me how to meditate. And after two years, I decided this is a much more of an interesting life than getting a PhD and being a professor. So I quit the graduate school and I went to Taiwan to live in a monastery there. I lived in Foguangshan for one year and then I wanted a smaller monastery, so I went to another monastery for over two years called Haiming Se, near, near Taipei. So it's interesting. I mean, in, in the beginning, you did it for the money. By when <laughs> did you realize, <laughs> by when did you realize this is something you want to pursue, that you want to stay and go deeper and, you know, wider in the pursuit of, in, in the Chinese language world? Well, after, uh, after uh, my four years in these two different monasteries, I, I moved to a farming village. Uh, uh, it, outside of Taipei, there was a mountain called Yangmingshan, and beyond Yangmingshan, there was another mountain called Qixingshan, and I lived in a farming village there for 14 years. And um, I made just enough money to live on, but I would read these Chinese texts, and I, I was so impressed that I could, I could read the Tao Te Ching. I could mm. read the Confucian Analects, Lun Yu, or I could read a Buddha Sutra. It was like having these teachers 
Um, right. And it was just my personal relationship. And also I had no job really. I would teach a little bit of English to make money, but I had all this time on my hands. So I, I became very, I would read a text over and over and over until I, I got deeply, had a deep understanding of it. And that's when I began translating. And that's why I said it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like having Confucius for your teacher if you're a translator. You can read Confucius, but if you try to translate it, you have to spend so much time with him, lots of time, because you're going to misunderstand many things. Right. Um, so I had this wonderful opportunity because I had left America. I wasn't interested in a profession. I wasn't interested in money. I was living in a farming village, and I had all this time on my hands. So I was, I was free to, to explore this, and I got... I got to the point where I felt like, I like this, I love this. Did it ever occur to you that you were doing something that's extremely niche, if I can use this word, because not many people would resort to, you know, translating Tao Te Ching or Confucius, Confucianism and try to spread it in the West. Of course, there are some people who are doing that, but it's an extremely small group of people who would, be, who would do that and who would be interested in that. Did you think about well, that? For, for, well, for me, it was about my life path. The reason I quit graduate school and lived in a monastery is because of my, I wanted to follow a spiritual path. And so, and by learning Chinese, it, I was able to have all of these people for my teachers. Confucius was my teacher. And the Buddha was my teacher. Lao Tzu was my teacher. And Tao Yuan Ming was my teacher. So interesting. You said you you want to follow follow a kind of spiritual path. What about these people that that talk to you, that draw you closer towards them? Because obviously it's the traditional Chinese culture, the traditional Chinese philosophy way of thinking, their understanding of the relationship between man and nature, and so on and so forth. What about this that draws you towards them instead of uh, the world that you're already very familiar with? Well, just uh, you get to a point when you think that the world is crazy, that the, the world is, is chaotic, that it's, it's heading in, in a direction that you just can't, you, you don't want to be part of it anymore. That was part of the reason why I, I left Colombia and went to live in a monastery. I wanted to find out what's the right way to live this life. We only get this life, at least one life at a time. And so it was important to me to, to find out if, if I was going to live this life, how should I do it? And, and then I had all of these teachers that I met, like Confucius. I learned a lot from Confucius or, and the same with Lao Tzu. And it was just by having the ability and the time. There, I didn't take any tests, no exams. I didn't have to write papers. I didn't have to report to anybody. I just had to report to myself. I, had, I read until I felt I had something from Confucius or Lao Tzu. Yeah, share with us a thing or two what you learned from one of these three. For instance, for, for a lot of people, it would be very abstract. For instance, what would you say you learned from Lao Tzu or from Confucius that you can think of at this moment? Well, of course, when you, when you study Confucius or, or, or Lao Tzu, you, there are many, many books about it. But when all I wanted to do was just read the text. I didn't want to talk to, read books about Confucius. I want to read what the Lun Yun said, or, 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 or the, Dao, that the Tao Te Ching. Um, and it was in the course of reading the, the Tao Te Ching, I, I, I discovered that uh, the Tao Te Ching was about the moon. Uh, it was about not just the, the, the moon that we think of, it was about the dark moon. Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching was about being the dark side of the moon, not the bright side of the moon. The, I, I, later sort of realized that the, the I Ching is about being the full moon, being successful. The Lao book Tzu's of change. Ching, yes, not just change, but, but what we, things change, of course. But when you read the I Ching, it's all about using change to be successful. Okay. Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching is about being a failure, how to fail, how to be the dark side of the moon, how to be the weak rather than the strong. Because if you're the dark of the moon, then you're going to become light, bright. If you're the bright moon, then you're going to fade. And so this is what, what the great lesson I've learned from Lao Tzu's Tao, Tao Te Ching, is the cultivation 
of of being simple and and weak and and um, the feminine, uh, being on the dark side, and also not knowing so much because we we discover that our knowledge is not really knowledge after all. It's just delusion posing posing as the truth. And of course, I I got that from the from the Buddha, that what we think of it, that we know is just what everybody says something is so. Well, so I, I, I discover all of these, it's sort of like these are all doors. The Buddha door is about, uh, they're all about harmony. Whether it's the harmony of the mind is Buddhism. The harmony of the body is Taoism. The harmony of society is Confucianism. And we're all, if we're all searching for something, when we find ourselves in like a burning house in a world gone crazy and we want to go through one of these doors, we have to choose which door. And we all have different personalities and inclinations, so we're going to choose a different door. But we have to go through one door. We can't go through three doors. But once we go through that door, we're outside. There are no doors. There is no Lao Tzu, there is no Taoism and Buddhism and Confucianism. It's 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 no more no more divisions about what's what's real. But after so that's many what attracted years, me. Yeah, yeah, after so many years you got what you're trying to get, that you have found the way, <laughs> let's say. Well, finding the way is just the beginning. Then you have to then you have to incorporate it in your life. In a sense, the easy part is finding the truth. The hard part is making it true in, inside of you. Wow. So I'm but, working on that. Yeah, I know. I mean, we all have that wish, right, in our mind to be in that harmonious state. But uh, life is um, sometimes doesn't leave you with many choices. So you have to, you have to slowly find ways towards that perfect state, let's say. Um, but I want to get back to your experience. You were looking, you started looking for hermits on the mainland, right, after your time in Taiwan. And I thought that was, a, that was a fascinating idea because nowadays, to think of the idea of hermits is almost unthinkable. Everybody busy, trying to develop, trying to get rich, find job, children, you know, wealth, status, knowledge, however you may name it. But hermits is almost like the exact opposite of every, everything I just mentioned. But why did you, what, what convinced you that you could find something when you started looking for hermits in 1989? Well, I had translated the poetry of Han Shan, and Han Shan was a hermit. And uh, I always wondered, are there really people like that? Or is just, this just a literary conceit? You know, some writers write things, but things aren't really that way. They just have ideas, you know, it's, it's a literary technique. So I wondered if people really liked that. And so um, until 1987, when Taiwan people finally started coming to China, to, to the mainland, I decided I want to go too. I want to go to, to China and just find out, do people like, like Han Shan really live? And I didn't know where to find a hermit. So I just happened to be in Beijing uh, and I met a monk named Jinghui Fasher, Master mm -hmm. Jinghui. And I asked him, I said, have you heard of any place where there are still people practicing in the mountains? And he said, yeah, I, south, south of Xi'an in the, the Zhongnan Mountains. Yeah. And so yeah. I, went, I went there, went to the Zhongnan Mountains, and I found all of these people living in the mountains, practicing, Taoists and Buddhists. And actually, most of them were women. About 60% of them were women, not just men. Yeah, that's where, where this book came from, right? Konggu Yolan. Yes, yes. Yeah, that yes. documented your experience looking for, I, and these were hermits. Uh, this was a hermit, and these were you. You had a, a huge beard. Was this one you? Yeah, no, that, no, that was my, my photographer. I took a photographer. Okay, friend, this was you. Much younger back me. then. Much yeah. younger. We're always younger then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a fascinating uh, story. And, and actually, this book got very popular in China because a lot of Chinese people found out this aspect in their modern society that deep in the mountains there are these people who are not interested in, in the things that they were pursuing. But um, um, what do you think 
is important about the spirit of hermits that if, if someone needs to understand the Chinese people, the Chinese society, do you think these spirit of hermits are still there deep down in the Chinese character? Of course it is, because I, when I would go to these, these, uh, these, these huts where these, these people lived, I would often meet people from the city who had gone up to find out how to help them. Um, like the last time, the most famous hermit on the mountain in the Jungnan Mountains was a was a, a, a Buddhist nun who had been in the herm in the mountains for thirty five years. The last time I saw her alive, there were six members of the of the of, of the Gongchang Dam in her hut who had hiked <laughs> up the mountain, and they wanted to know how they could help her. Hmm. It, so that it's the even though people didn't know there were people like this anymore, um, they still carried that respect for that kind of person. So once I wrote this book and people started going back into this mountain, these mountains, they still have the same respect for these people. Ever since ancient times, the hermit has been really important to Chinese society, whether it's Zhuge Liang or, or any, anybody uh, in the past. Sometimes the emperor would ask a hermit to become the emperor and the hermit would refuse. There have been these people who sort of live aloof from society, but the, the, the important thing I would like to tell you about the hermits I met is that you don't do this to spend your life as a hermit. It's like going to graduate school. These are people on a spiritual mission and they go into the mountains, but not very long, usually three to five years, and then they come down the mountain. Some people stay, maybe 5% of the hermits stay in the mountains. But most of the hermits who stay more than one winter, you have to make go through one winter. But once you've been through one winter, most of them stay three to five years until they feel like they've learned what they need to learn. And then they come down to society because the thing about the hermit tradition is those are, those are all the great teachers. Yeah. They, or they, can, they can become the great teachers. And it's really hard to find a great teacher who has not spent time alone, whether it's a couple of months or a couple of years. But hermits aren't like our hermits in America. Our hermits in America run away from society. They want nothing to do with people. But Chinese hermits want to help people. But they know they have to learn something so they can help people. So there is also the, the debate or the duality between chu shi and ru shi, right? You want to withdraw from society, but you also want to go back into society because you need to serve the people. So that, that's the difference between Taoism, some, between Lao Tzu and Kung Tzu, because Lao Tzu is about withdrawal to, to be in the world of yourself, but Kung Tzu is all, always about learning and then giving back, right? Contributing to the society. Uh, yes, you want to add? But then most of the great hermits in Chinese society were Confucians, not Taoists. But there were people who felt that the emperor, the government, was not ruling the people according to the Tao, according to the way, according to the understanding of Confucius, and therefore they should retire. It's always a question. It's a, it's a, it's a big problem that you have to ask yourself, should I serve or not? Maybe they become disgruntled a little bit, maybe because of... Uh, power struggle that they were, you know, sidelined. That they they kind of had, and there was this saying also, "Da ying ying yu shi." If you the real it's, big hermits, <laughs> is in the city. Uh, is in the city. So I want to draw you your attention to this poem now. Actually, Tao Yuanming is a very interesting example. I would say, wouldn't you agree? Because there are many people who are obviously, Absolutely. yeah, obviously actively engaged in modern life in society, being officials, business people, but they, deep in their heart, they have a place for Tao Yuanming. Tell us a bit your understanding of Tao Yuanming. Well, I've always been, ever since I discovered Chinese poetry, I've been attracted to his poetry. But Why? I've had a heart, I've, because it was about going back to the countryside, you know, living life of simplicity. And so I've always wanted to translate his poetry, but it's so hard to understand. He uses a very short line, sometimes four syllables uh, or five syllables, never more than five syllables. Okay. Not like, not like Tang Dynasty, Li Bai Dufu, which is 
much easier to understand, but timing was, was very hard. So I've only recently, finally, uh, about a year ago, I decided it's finally time for me to under, to translate uh, Tao Yunming. So now I'm, really? I'm just it finished. It took you so I, long? It took you so long? It, it took me so long to begin, wow. to think that I, was, I, I could do it. And, okay. uh, you want to share with us? You want to share with sure. us? Sure. Do you want yes. to pick one of them? This one, by the way, I would say is the most famous poem known by many, many Chinese people. Shall I read the poem in Chinese and then you do it oh, in English? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Let's, because I let's think to, to, to remind a lot of people the, the lyrics, the exact lines of, of this poem. So, Ying Jiu, Tao Yuan Ming. Jie Lu Zai Ren Jing, Er Wu Che Ma Xuan. Wen Jun He Neng Er, Xin Yuan Di Zi Pian. It's a wonderful poem. Was it okay? Thank you. Yeah, thank That's you. Beautiful. Thank you. Yes, it is a beautiful poem. So you want to. Well, here's my English translation. I built my hut beside the path, but I hear neither cart nor horse. You ask, how can this be? When the mind travels, so does the place. Picking chrysanthemums by the eastern fence, I lose myself in the southern hills. The mountain air, the sunset light, birds flying home together. In this, there is a truth I'd explain if I could remember the words. Nice, yeah. But help us explain this poem. What does he want to say, really? He actually says he built his hut in a busy place, but he doesn't hear the noise of the traffic, right? So what, is, what yeah. kind of state of mind is that? What is he trying well, see, to say? Well, well Tao Yanming was not a hermit. Um, not like a, we think of a hermit. He, was, he never went to live in the mountains. He had friends who lived in the mountains, but he lived in a small village, and he he could let the let the world go. He was able to let the world go, and his mind goes to the mountain. His mind is like the birds flying back to the mountains. And yet he chose not to be a hermit. Yet he chose yes. not to withdraw completely from from society. He was not right. That's totally. why he, he's right. He has his. His hut is right on the tr on the road there. Yeah, yeah. So that he he still has a sense of he, his mission was not done. Maybe he still has things he wanted to contribute to the society. Yeah, Would you say that way? Yes, and those those things were I think for us it, are his poems. Finally, I know that um, you have a particular penchant for singing or chanting poems, and. Actually, according to some people, that's basically the way how ancient poems were supposed to be recited, right? Not really um, as we're doing, but in a, in a musical way. Do you want to? Well, that's right. Yeah. Do you want to share with us one example? Okay, I will. Well, when I was first in Taiwan, uh, one of my uh, I, I studied calligraphy. Went a uh, shufa. Yeah. I kind of studied calligrapher with the most famous calligrapher in Taiwan. His name was Zhuang Yan. And so one day after class, I said, uh, Lao Shi, I hear that Chinese don't read poems, they sing them. But I, I look at the page and I don't see any musical notes. Mm -hmm. now, how do you do that? He said, just a minute. He went into the kitchen and then he came back and he put a bottle of Dachi Joe on the table. Dachi Joe. Yes, whiskey. Okay. And he says, this is, how you, this is how you sing poems. Jian Zai Yin Shi. Yin Joe. Okay, okay. He, 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 because, and that's uh, how I learned how that, that insure, it doesn't depend upon whether you really know how to insure. It depends on, on letting your spirit go a little bit, yeah. you know, because that's, that's how the poems were written. Anyway, one of the most famous uh, poems I remember from, from uh, studying with him and uh, writing it out with my calligraphy brush was the poem Zhong uh, uh, by, by by Su Shi. Mm -hmm. Where he goes, Mu Yin Shou Jin Yi Ching Han 
Inhan he and his brother, this is a poem he wrote to his brother, Su Che, Su Tzio, mm -hmm. because they, they, they only met, you know, maybe every four or five years, they would have yeah. a chance to, to, to get together. So I always just love this simple little poem he, he wrote about, about just watching the moon and wondering, will we see this again? Will we see this again together? Yeah, they were very, very touching close. poem. And yeah. that, so that's what I love about Chinese poetry. You can say so much with so little. True. This is actually, believe it or not, this is actually the first time I hear someone sing a Chinese po poem. So thank you very much for that. Well, that was, that's why I love to translate Chinese poetry, is because I discovered that, that the, you know, the character of, of, chi of Shi, Chinese poetry, a long, long time ago, uh, the man who, Zheng, Xu, Zheng Xuan, made the first definition of poetry. Dai Xin. When, when what is in your heart is expressed, that is poetry. And that's the yeah. essence of Chinese poetry. It is words, words from, from the heart. From the heart. And, and so as a trans yeah. yeah. And so that's why I love Chinese poetry and I love to translate it because it puts me in touch with a man's heart who lived a thousand years ago. So to wrap up, finally, uh, let the cat out of the bag what is the key to translation in one sentence, if you haven't said it already? Well, just what, we, what I just said, finding the heart of the poet. You have to go beyond the words. The words tell you there's a poem here, mm. but, but th those words were put down, put, put, put on the page by someone felt, who felt something in their heart. Right. Those words came from the heart, so you, you have to go there. You have to find what you You have to go to, to another yeah. person's heart. Yeah, that's so beautiful. That process is really beautiful. How life takes us sometimes you never know, but uh, you always, if you keep looking, you end up in the place you want it to be. Thank you so much, Bill Porter, and uh, known in Chinese as Red Pine. I hope you will, you will get to that harmonious state that you're probably already in, yeah? I can, it can always be better. Yeah. I'll try harder tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bill, bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was my conversation with Bill Porter, who joined me from Port uh, Townsend near Seattle. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Liu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point. <laughs>